Birds are really amazingly powerful tools. For centuries, they've been very, very important scientific research devices. They teach us how nature works, so we understand a lot about our natural systems by work done on birds. But they're also extremely sensitive environmental indicators. Many people don't realize that a very large proportion of our, of our birds in North America, as well as the ones across Europe and Asia, they do their big global migrations, mainly at night. So literally during the fall from September to November, most parts of the US, people don't realize this, but millions of birds are flying over their heads during the night. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with John Fitzpatrick, or Fitz to his friends. Fitz is one of the world's foremost ornithologists and conservationists. He has run the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology since 1995, building it into one of the world's most effective organizations for understanding and protecting birds and fostering conservation globally. He has kept the Cornell Lab on the cutting edge of science and conservation by using technology to significantly expand its outreach. Yes, welcome to Straight Talk. I'm an unabashed fan because I've witnessed on a firsthand basis what you and the Cornell Lab are doing to make a big difference all over the world. So I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. Thanks, let's, thanks, so am I. Let's start at the beginning. How and when did your interest in birding start? So I grew up in a, in a rural section of Minnesota, uh, not too far north of the Twin Cities in the early 50s. And I know that by the time I was in kindergarten, I was interested in birds. I remember identifying a, an American Red Star because my dad and mom had an old Peterson field guide and a pair of binoculars. My dad was a hunter, so he was an outdoorsman, and uh, that I regard as a huge privilege in my childhood. I identified this red star. I was homesick from kindergarten, and, I, and that made me look at the book and say, oh my God, look at all these other birds that are out there. And so it sort of started this desire really early to see more of them. And uh, so I just fell in love. I always loved walking around outside. I confess I resented Sunday school because one of the only two days in the week when I could walk around in the morning out in the woods, I didn't want to cash it in to going, sitting inside. So so I was very fortunate. Also, my parents, I have to acknowledge, my parents had some other friends who were birders. So early on, there was a supportive community, and uh, I just never looked back. It's interesting because you, you just obviously had that gene. You know, my wife, Wendy's fascinated by birds. And so when we had a five-year-old son, she was trying to teach him. And, you know, it was quite interesting. She'd point out, someone would point out the window and say, what's that? And expecting him to say a bird. And he'd say, Wang Kweepa. I mean, for <laughs> but, but, it, but it never caught. He never went to the book and, uh -huh. and, and started learning it himself. Yeah, interesting. Well, the books, books mattered a lot as a kid. I remember being given pretty early after mom and dad knew that I had this interest. They gave me uh, this great book, uh, called Birds of the World, um, illustrated by Arthur Singer, really famous, beautiful book. And I'm just the you know, same deal looking through these pages and just imagining this world of cockatoos and macaws and emus and things. And so, yeah, it was, a, it was some, something hit really early. And I was privileged, I have to say, through high school and college, basically I knew what I wanted to do. Uh, as long as I could make it, I wanted to make sure I kept studying birds. And I had a backup. I was a beekeeper as a kid. And I figured at some point I can't make this anymore in this profession. I'll just go keep bees. <laughs> <laughs> My first book was on animal tracks, and I couldn't quite figure out how to make a career in that. <laughs> but, but, but let's move on to sort of the big picture today, you know, which is hard on all of us, any of us that, that love birds. Bird populations are in a dramatic decline in North America and all over the world. So describe 
the magnitude of the problem and why it matters. Why is this happening? What are the causes? And how does protecting birds help foster biodiversity conservation more broadly? Now, there's a lot in that yeah. question, but unpack it for us. Super interesting question, really important question. Um, for one thing, you're absolutely right. We now have definitive quantitative estimates for the degree to which North America has lost its birds. We've lost 3 billion birds since 1970. That's almost a third of the uh, breeding birds of the continent. And one thing we know from work that we're doing recently is that these trends are not just trends of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. These are trends that are continuing to be experienced even as we speak right now. There are losses of birds, huge losses of birds across Europe. And we know that as landscapes are cleared in the tropical uh, and developing world, uh, enormous amounts of biodiversity are being lost uh, as we speak. And the cause is basically because, you know, seven pushing eight billion people have a lot of demands uh, for staying alive, staying healthy, staying fed. And we, for most of our existence, we haven't paid attention to the fact that th these numbers, we're managing the globe. We are in charge of the natural areas of the world and we're not doing a good job of it. Uh, so a, a lot of what we're doing in studying birds is learning how we can do a better job of living side by side with functioning natural systems while we as cultures continue to be uh, you know, able to enjoy rich, fulfilling lives. That's a key challenge. And you asked why it's important. The birds are really amazingly powerful tools. For one thing, for centuries, they've been very, very important scientific research devices. They teach us how nature works so we understand a lot about our natural systems by work done on birds, but they're also extremely sensitive environmental indicators. As bird populations change, they're changing because of underlying systems, the ecosystems underneath them. And that's their true power. They are barometers for larger scale problems that are actually a lot harder for us to measure and understand. And the last thing I'll say in terms of the power of birds is as you know well, Hank, you and Wendy experience this all the time. Birds absolutely just tear and tug and sing in our hearts. We have spiritual, aesthetic relationships with birds that are, it's the other side of our brain from the intellect. So birds actually stimulate at the same time both sides of our brain and by getting people involved in birds and starting to understand what these declines mean, we can increase the extent to which they understand that we're changing the whole landscape, not just losing our birds. Yep, for sure. And, you know, getting to the tropics, Wendy and I visited Peru a few years ago, and we got to see two bird species that you discovered years ago. Yeah. <laughs> what, what took you to the tropics? You know, here you are in Minnesota and you went to the tropics, and how did it feel to discover a new bird species? I can only imagine what that must feel like. Oh, it's, a, it's an absolute thrill. I, I was privileged to take a few trips to the tropics while I was in college, thanks to my mentor of, at Harvard, who himself used to work a lot in the tropics. And he took a couple of us eager undergrads down there. And I, once you see the tropics, as you know, Hank, once you've experienced the tropics, it's in your blood. It, the mega diversity is just hard to imagine. And so you always want to go back as soon as you've been there just to see this enormous wealth of, of things. And so, so I, in graduate school, I made a commitment to go studying in life a bunch of these birds I got interested in in college. These are the tyrant flycatchers, lots of variations on little green bird. And so I got a chance to explore a bunch of different parts of South America. I spent a lot of time in Peru. It's one of the most mega diverse countries in the world. And on that summer of, of 1975, we took a kind of a lark. We did a two and a half week trip to a mountain ridge up in Northern Peru where we knew that no scientific exploration had occurred on that area. We strung about 16 mist nets out there. And this is the God's truth the very first bird we took out of the mist net on the first morning <laughs> was this little wren with a short tail and wing bars. And my colleague, Dave Willard and I, Dave's at the Field Museum in Chicago still to this day. And my colleague, Dave Willard looked at each other and said, 
what is this? There's no wren, wren with wing bars. So we knew right off the bat that we had taken an undescribed bird out of the net. Obviously, we therefore knew that it was a pretty interesting place. It turns out we collected a uh, one specimen of a hummingbird that we couldn't identify. That might have been one of the ones you saw, the royal sun angel. It was one of them. Right? Yeah, well, that hummingbird, we didn't know what it was. And at that time, there were no field guides available for this part of the world. And so took a specimen back to New York, Smithsonian, Chicago. No collection had a bird like this. So I organized a, another little jaunt of some colleagues back to the same spot the following summer when we collected the female and could determine that it was in fact a new species of the genus Heliangelus, but we also got five other <laughs> undescribed things. So it was an owl and another flycatcher and a little brush finch. I mean, it was just a, a, a gold mine of undiscovered species. Uh, so yeah, quite a rush, quite a great privilege for me to be able to work in the field of avian taxonomy as a result of those discoveries. So Fitz, what is so extraordinary about you, and I've worked with a lot of really outstanding people, is that usually when you get someone that is so good from an early age at, at some topic like birding, it's very seldom you get that same person that's able to become a manager and a leader and then be farsighted. And so I want to go a little bit to the Cornell labs and you know you were very foresighted you unleashed the power of technology and citizen science and crowdsourcing you know to magnify your mission and get results so i'd like you to tell our listeners about ebird what is it how does it advance science and unite and empower bird lovers globally because this is something that i see every week when i go out birding with my wife she's you know, she's logging in eBird. So yeah, that's good. Yeah, hope she keeps that up. I love hearing Wendy talk about running into people in the mountains of Ecuador, keeping their eBird lists. It's very satisfying. Yeah, eBird is now a remarkable global scale opportunity for anybody who watches birds to put their checklists into a personal folder and have those checklists immediately join a massive global database that now we're receiving more than a million checklists every single month. And this all started with the hypothesis back in the 90s that this newfangled thing that was spreading called the internet actually gave us a chance to have a two-way relationship with people in a distributed way. By the early couple of years of the internet, it was mainly a one-way device. It was a way of advertising your stuff or you know, teaching externally. What we started doing was asking people to send information into us and we could in turn, turn it around, make maps out of it, send it back to the uh, people. And this turned into an extraordinary positive feedback because people who watch birds love to understand them in, a, in patterns. What's their whole distribution? How do they change through the year? How do they change year after year? And uh, eBird now gives this opportunity. It's by far the largest biodiversity database in the world. And we've now invested at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, not just in the technology for maintaining this and helping the people around the world keep their lists. We've invested in the amazing group of uh, sophisticated data analysts who can now dive into these major databases of distributions and actually ask questions about how one year differs from another, how species differ from one another in terms of their full annual cycle, where they're wintering, where they're migrating through, what their abundances are at different times of the year, and how they affect one another. So just an infinite variety of ways of understanding nature are now available to us in this candy store of information that eBird is producing. Amazing. So I'm going to go now to another breakthrough I think you've had with technology. You know, for bird watchers, if you're going to be any good, you're going to have to be able to identify their song. And, and I'm pleased that I can identify birds, dozens of birds by their song. Now, going back years, I noted that you and your know, other first rate ornithologists that can identify thousands of birds mm -hmm. by their song. But what really gets me is those that can identify by one chip. You'll hear one from a chip, right? Uh -huh. Not even their song yeah. identified it. But 
What you've done now at the Cornell Lab is you've got a library there and you catalog thousands of bird songs from around the world. But taking it a step further, you now have advanced technology. So you can identify and monitor birds migrating at night by the chips and chirps different species make and track migrating patterns. It just sort of blew my mind when I was with you one evening and you you get the equipment out and you look at the recording and you know exactly what's happened. Tell us about that. Uh, really remarkable. Many people don't realize that a very large proportion of our, of our birds in North America, as well as the ones across Europe and Asia, they do their big global migrations mainly at night. So literally during the fall from September to November, most parts of the U.S., People don't realize this, but millions of birds are flying over their heads during the night. And a good number, not all, but a good number of those birds make these very high pitched, very difficult to hear for people who, uh, whose hearing stops out at eight or nine kilohertz, but each one of them is different. And so yes, by recording these birds and sending them now through advanced trained algorithms, we can actually get those things individually identified so that over a given night, we can identify what the predominant species of birds were that were flying over. And then, and here's the most uh, magical part of this now, thanks to the uh, NEXRAD radar system that was uh, introduced across the US in the 1990s, we can take the radar data from every single night. We can take out the uninteresting stuff, which is most people call weather, get that out of these radar systems. And the stuff that's left are birds. And so what we have now in, in a project that's uh, online called BirdCast is a real-time measurement of the migratory pattern, nocturnal migrations of birds all across the continent. And combining that with the software that allows us to identify species, we're starting to paint a really pretty vivid picture of what birds are migrating over your head uh, across the U.S. every, every fall and every spring. We can also use those radar data now to actually go back and ask the question, how many birds were flying over the U.S. down towards Mexico in the fall in the 1990s compared with the 20 teens? And lo and behold, indeed, the results of that corroborate the results of other studies that are showing that big decline. Is there just plain smaller biomass of birds moving to the tropics as reflected in those radar data. So it is, as you pointed out, the lab of ornithology, I make this joke, I used to hire bird people. I'm hiring all tech people now. It's all about uh, digital technology and what, how we can apply that for understanding the really important biological patterns that birds give us access to. And, it's, and Fitz, I'm gonna correct you because it's not just tech people you're hiring unbelievably good photographers. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so you've documented images, amazing photography of species from all over the world, which are housed in a Cornell laboratory. So the film your Cornell team put together documenting illegal and, and what I thought heartbreaking netting and trapping of birds in China made a real difference. So that was a case of images being more powerful than a thousand words and furthering the cause of conservation. So tell us a bit about the power of photography, yeah. why you do it, and how you integrate it into your work. It's a super interesting and important question. Humans are visual species. We, we all know that. We are all blessed with darn good color vision. We love watching things in action. It's one of the reasons that sports is so uh, alluring for us. We're very visual and what has transformed our lives since the internet came into being and along with it, the technology of really, really top quality camera equipment, lenses and cameras, is the opportunity to tell stories visually that are far more difficult to tell just with words or diagrams. And so about 10 or 12 years ago, Recognizing the value of multimedia in a way as a way of telling a story, really important stories. We opened a shop here. At that time, we opened it on uh, basically fumes because we didn't really have the money to do it. 
but I just said, this is too important not to do. So we said, let's build a body of work and hopefully we can begin to attract the funding to be able to make this happen and make it big time. And we've done that. So uh, our conservation media shop headed by John Bowman, whom we hired away from National Geographic, really has this, you pointed out the media of the netting, illegal netting in China, which did actually have a measurable impact on the behaviors of Chinese regulators getting rid of that. As you know, we've also told stories about the importance of the Yellow Sea, and you yourself and the Paulson Institute have played a huge role in moving that media into places where it ends up helping to convince governments to say we have to stop making the impacts on those shorelines that we've been having. So that's what this group does. And we're, as you pointed out, we have some of the very best nature cinematographers in the world. We have a feature plus a bunch of school materials on the Philippine Eagle that's making it all the way across the Philippines helping convince all the people and cultures of the Philippines to save the last 5% of their rainforest so that their national bird can survive. Yeah. So we're targeting stories and telling the story as effectively as we can using these phenomenal, the phenomenal talent of these photographers and editors. So the proverbial metaphor of the coal miner's canary really plays it out. I, I watched it with the coastal shoreline in China, where, where these habitats were being destroyed, they are now making a big effort to conserve them. And the vehicle that was used was the migrating shorebirds. Yep, absolutely. That's the, and and uh, as you know, of course, uh, millions of people make their living depending on the biological richnesses of those tidal flats in the Yellow Sea. The bird declines that were a consequence of the rapid development and commercialization of those coastlines were also were barometers. They were the canaries in the coal mine for a whole uh, bunch of people as well as the birds themselves. The uh, canaries in the coal mine is absolutely the right metaphor to use for these birds all over the world. And guess what? The planet is the coal mine. You, you, you so as we watch birds decline, what it does is it tips us off to the things that we can actually change, make a difference, we can, for example, ban DDT as we did in the 70s and watch the peregrine falcon, one of your favorite birds, come back from the brink of extinction across the lower 48 to now more abundant than it's been probably in the last 200 years. If we change behavior, these birds are resilient enough to bounce back. And so by changing behavior, of course, in the case of DDT and other stories like it, we are also affecting our own health in a positive way. So birds give us these indicators of how we can improve our own lives as well as the bird lives. So Fitz, that really gets me into the last question I have for you today. There's so much bad news about declining bird populations, massive extinction of biodiversity more broadly. Give us some good news. What gives you hope as you look forward? Because, you know, one of the things I love about you is you're a realist, but you're an optimist. I appreciate that compliment, Hank. I've always felt like an optimist. You can't give up hope. We have to act as if we can make a difference because we know we can and have in lots of different places. The Peregrine story being just one of a whole bunch of success stories we could talk about. The hope that we have rests in a couple of different things. Number one, birds are amazingly resilient. So as soon as we find out what problems are that are causing declines, we know we can make differences to bring their populations back. But even more, in fact, I would say more recently with the advent of COVID-19 and the you know, tremendous changes that it has put into our lives, our social lives and our professional lives, what we saw this last spring was remarkable in that everybody started watching birds. They started recognizing that out their windows, because look, they're at home. Out their windows are these remarkable, colorful songsters that in the spring were migrating back. We got peppered with media questions and public queries about, are there just more birds around right now? Or is it just that we're looking at them more? And uh, so birds have this phenomenal draw for us humans. And as we get more and more humans, and this is true globally, not just in the US, as we get more people interested in birds, 
what that's meaning is that they're beginning to pay attention to what the birds need to be able to stay alive. And it turns out they begin discovering, you know what, humans need those things too. Uh, so there's a huge amount of hope in our world because as more and more people gain appreciation for what birds are and what they represent, there's a more and more a movement of cultures across the planet to saving them and to living again closer and closer to a, what I like to say is living side by side with these natural systems. Birds themselves give us hope. They are so amenable to study that it, they give us a real uh, opportunity for being scientific about our understanding of climate change and humans effect on the planet. So we, we have a lot of hope at the Cornell lab and, and we place hope on the wings of science at the lab. Uh, birds help us do that. Well said. Fitz, this has been fun and hopefully illuminating to some who didn't fully understand the connection of birds to conservation. And of course, you and I both know that the protection and conservation of biodiversity, which is expressed so beautifully in birds, is essential to the long-term health and prosperity of the world. So keep up the good work. Thank you very much, Hank. I appreciate those words. And I certainly, as we all do at the lab, appreciate the work that you and the Paulson Institute have been doing on behalf of the biodiversity of the world. So my thanks to you as well. You have listened to Stray Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.